<clears throat> okay, back again. Chapter nine. This is a sad chapter. One Lung, sitting at the threshold of his door, said to himself that now, surely, something must be done. They could not remain here in this empty house and die. In his lean body, about which he daily wrapped more tightly his loose girdle, there was a determination to live. He would not thus, just when he was coming into the fullness of a man's life, suddenly be robbed of it by a stupid fate. There was such anger in him now as he often could not express. At times it seized him like a frenzy, so that he rushed out upon his barren threshing floor and shook his arms at the foolish sky that shone above him, eternally blue and clear and cold and cloudless. Oh, you are too wicked, you old men in heaven, he would cry recklessly. And if for an instant he were afraid, he would the next instant cry sullenly, and what can happen to me worse than that which has happened? Once he walked, dragging one foot after another in his famished weakness to the temple of the earth, and deliberately he spat upon the face of the small, imperturbable God who sat there with his goddess. There were no sticks of incense now before this pair, nor had there been for many moons, and their paper clothes were tattered and showed their clay bodies through the rents. Rents is another word for tears. But they sat there unmoved by anything, and Wang Lu gnashed his teeth at them and walked back to his house groaning and fell upon his bed. They scarcely rose at all now, any of them. There was no need, and fitful sleep took the place for a while at least of the food they had not. The cobs of the corn they had dried and eaten, and they stripped the bark from trees, and all over the countryside people were eating what grass they could find upon the wintry hills. There was not an animal anywhere. A man might walk for a handful of days and see not an ax, I'm sorry, not an ox, nor an ass, nor any kind of beast or fowl. The children's bellies were swollen out with empty wind. Have you seen those pictures of starving children? Usually from Africa it shows them, and they're just skin and bones like a skeletal skeleton, except for their ponderous bellies. It's very sad. I'm not sure why that happens, um, but I know it does. The children's bellies were swollen out with empty wind, and one never saw in these days a child playing upon a village street. At most, the two boys in Wang Lung's house crept to the door and sat in the sun, the cruel sun that never ceased its endless shining. Their once rounded bodies were angular and bony now, sharp small bones like the bones of birds, except for their ponderous bellies. The girl child never even sat alone, although the time was past for this, but lay uncomplaining hour after hour wrapped in an old quilt. So did you catch that? This girl child is old enough that she should be able to sit up, sit alone by herself, but she can't. At first, the angry insistence of her crying had filled the house, but she had come to be quiet, sucking feebly at whatever was put into her mouth and never lifting up her voice. Her little hollow face peered out at them all, little sunken blue lips like a toothless old woman's lips and hollow black eyes peering. This persistence of the small life in some way won her father's affection, although if she had been round and merry as the others had been at her age, he would have been careless of her for a girl. Do you know what that's saying? This is very interesting, and this chapter is going to reveal a very tender, interesting side of Wang Lu. 
because this is saying that for some reason, maybe it's because of how hard this girl fights to live. Like, um, you know, she, she just doesn't get any food. And at first she was crying a lot, but now she stops crying and yet she's still fighting to live. And so this is telling us that if she had been normal and healthy, like his baby boys were when they were small, like she is, he wouldn't have cared anything about her because she was a girl. Uh, but he's going to, you're going to see, he's going to develop through this time of famine in that little girl. He's going to develop a tremendous and fierce attachment and devotion to her. Sometimes looking at her, he whispered softly, poor fool, poor little fool. And once when she essayed a weak smile, when she tried to smile with her toothless gums showing, he broke into tears and took into his lean hard hand, her small claw and held the tiny grasp of her fingers over his forefinger. Thereafter, he would sometimes lift her all naked as she lay and thrust her inside the scant warmth of his coat against his flesh and sit with her. So by the threshold of the house, looking out over the dry flat fields. As for the old man, he fared better than any. For if there was anything to eat, he was given it, even though the children were without. Now that is totally different than in our culture. In the Asian culture, the old people are to be revered and re greatly respected. So that's telling us if there's any food to eat, the old man gets it. Wow. Wang Lung said to himself proudly that none should say in the hour of death he had forgotten his father. Even if his own flesh went to feed him, the old man should eat. Wow, that's really different, isn't it? The old man slept day and night and ate what was given him, and there was still strength in him to creep about the dooryard at noon when the sun was warm. He was more cheerful than any of them, and he quavered forth one day in his old voice that was like a little wind trembling among cracked bamboos, there have been worse days. There have been worse days. Once I saw men and women eating children. There will never be such a thing in my house, said Wang Lung in extremist horror. There was a day when his neighbor, Jing, worn now to less than the shadow of a human creature, came to the door of Wang Lung's house and he whispered from his lips that were dried and black as earth. In the town, the dogs are eaten, and everywhere the horses and the fowls of every sort. Here we have eaten the beasts that plowed our fields and the grass and the bark of trees. What now remains for food? Wang Ling shook his head hopelessly. In his bosom lay the, light, lay the slight, skeleton-like body of his girl child. And he looked down into the delicate, bony face and into the sharp, sad eyes that watched him unceasingly from his breast. When he caught those eyes in his glance, invariably there wavered upon the child's face a flickering smile that broke his heart. Jean thrust his face nearer. In the village, they are eating human flesh, he whispered. It is said your uncle and his wife are eating. How else are they living? And with strength enough to walk about, they who, it is known, have never had anything. Wang Lung drew back from the death-like head which Jing had thrust forward as he spoke. With the man's eyes close like this, he was horrible. 
Wang Lin was suddenly afraid with a fear he did not understand. He rose quickly as though to cast off some entangling danger. We will leave this place, he said loudly. We will go south. There are everywhere in this great land people who starve. Heaven, however wicked, will not at once wipe out the sons of Han. And the sons of Han means the sons of China. So he's saying, this is a big country. And, and you know, no matter how bad our luck has become, not everybody in China is going to die. So we're going to go someplace else. His neighbor looked at him patiently. Ah, oh, you are young, he said sadly. I am older than you. And my wife is old, and we have nothing except one daughter. We can die well enough. You are more fortunate than I, said Wang Lung. I have my old father and these three small mouths and another about to be born. We must go lest we forget our nature and eat each other as the wild dogs do. And then it seemed to him suddenly that what he said was very right. And he called aloud to Olan, who lay upon the bed day after day without speech, now that there was no food for the stove and no fuel for the oven. Come, woman, we will go south. There was cheer in his voice, such as none had heard in many moons. And the children looked up, and the old man hobbled out from his room, and Olan rose feebly from her bed and came to the door of their room, and clinging to the door frame, she said, It is a good thing to do. One can at least die walking. The child in her body hung from her lean loins like a naughty fruit. I mean, I know that this is hard, but, you know, she's very, she's nine months pregnant, and she's like a skeleton because of, there's no food for months now. She's like a skeleton except for this just little naughty fruit that's hanging on her belly. And from her face, every particle of flesh was gone so that the jagged bones stood forth rock-like under her skin. Only wait until tomorrow, she said. I shall have been, I shall have given birth by then. I can tell by this thing's movements in me. Tomorrow then, answered Wang Lu, and then he saw his wife's face, and he was moved with a pity greater than any he had had for himself. This poor creature was dragging forth yet another. How shall you walk, you poor creature, he muttered, and he said unwillingly to his neighbor Jing, who still leaned against the house by the door. See, he doesn't want to say this to Jing, but after looking at his wife, he loves her, and he can't believe the condition she's in. And he says to Jing, if you have any food left, for a good heart's sake, give me a handful to save the life of the mother of my sons, and I will forget that I saw you in my house as a robber. He didn't want to say this to Jean, but he's basically saying, I will forgive you for robbing me if you will just give me a handful of food for my wife. Jean looked at him ashamed and he answered humbly, I have never thought of you with peace since that hour. It was that dog, your uncle, who enticed me saying that you had good harvest stored up. Before this cruel heaven, I promise you that I have only a little handful of dried red beans buried beneath the stone of my doorway. This I and my wife placed there for our last hour, for our child and ourselves, that we might die with a little food in our stomachs. But some of it I will give to you, and tomorrow go south if you can. I stay, I in my house. I am older than you, and I have no son, and it does not matter whether I live or die. And he went away, and in a little while he came back, bringing tied in a cotton kerchief 
a double handful of small red beans moldy with the soil. The children clambered about at the sight of the food, and even the old man's eyes glistened. But Wang Lung pushed them away for once, and he took the food in to his wife as she lay. And she ate a little of it, bean by bean, unwilling. Why was she unwilling? Probably that she was taking from anybody else's food. Unwilling except that her hour was upon her and she knew that if she had not any food, she would die in the clutches of her pain. Only a few of the beans did Wang Lung hide in his own hand, and these he put into his own mouth and he chewed them into a soft pulp. And then, putting his lips to the lips of his daughter, he pushed into her mouth the food and watching her small lips move, he felt himself mad. That's one of the most beautiful lines in the book, honestly. And I know that you're probably still hung up on the grossness of he chewed that that those beans up. Well, she doesn't have teeth and she can't chew. And in the old days, actually, this was the way all quote baby food was made. I've heard old much older people than I tell of how oh yes this was the way all baby food was made somebody would chew it up and then they would give it to the baby i know that's gross but let's get back to the sweetness of this you know that's what i was telling you he has this bond with her that really can hardly be explained but this is how much he loves her he doesn't eat those beans himself he pushes those beans into her mouth and when you're a parent someday, you'll you'll really get this. This is why this is one of the books that you really need to reread when you get older. It'll mean so much to you. Okay, that night he stayed in the middle room. The two boys were in the old man's room, and in the third room, Olan gave birth alone. He sat there as he had sat during the birth of his firstborn son and listened. She would not even yet have him near her at her hour. She would give birth alone, squatting over the old tub she kept for the purpose, creeping about the room afterwards to remove the traces of what had been, hiding as an animal does the birth stains of its young. He listened intently for the small, sharp cry he knew so well, and he listened with despair. Male or female, it mattered nothing to him now. There was only another mouth coming which must be fed. It would be merciful if there were no breath, he muttered, and then he heard the feeble cry. How feeble a cry, hang for an instant upon the stillness. But there is no mercy of any kind in these days, he finished bitterly, and he sat listening. There was no second cry, and over the house the stillness became impenetrable. But for many days there had been stillness everywhere, the stillness of inactivity and of people, each in his own house, waiting to die. This house was filled with such stillness. Suddenly Wang Lu could not bear it. He was afraid. He rose and went to the door of the room where Olan was, and he called into the crack, and the sound of his own voice encouraged or heartened him a little. You are safe, he called to the woman. He listened. Suppose she had died as he sat there. But he could hear a slight rustling. She was moving about, and at last she answered, her voice a sigh. Come. He went in then. And she lay there upon the bed, her body scarcely raising the cover. That's how skinny she is. She lay alone. Where is the child? He asked. She made a slight movement of her hand upon the bed, and he saw upon the floor the child's body. Dead? He exclaimed. Dead, she whispered. He stooped 
and examined the handful of its body, a wisp of bone and skin. That means tiny, tiny, tiny baby, a girl. He was about to say, but I heard it crying, alive. And then he looked at the woman's face. Her eyes were closed, and the color of her flesh was the color of ashes, and her bones stuck up under the skin. A poor, silent face that lay there, having endured to the utmost, and there was nothing he could say. After all, during these months, he had had only his own body to drag about. What agony of starvation this woman had endured with the starved creature gnawing at her from within, desperate for its own life. He said nothing, but he took the dead child into the other room and laid it upon the earthen floor and searched until he found a bit of broken mat, and this he wrapped about it. The round head dropped this way and that, and upon the neck he saw two dark, bruised spots. Get that? Upon the neck he saw two dark, bruised spots. But he finished what he had to do. Then he took the roll of matting and going as far from the house as he had strength, he laid the burden against the hollowed side of an old grave. This grave stood among many others, worn down and no longer known or cared for, on a hillside just at the border of Wang Lung's western field. He had scarcely put the burden down before a famished, wolfish dog hovered almost at once behind him, so famished, the dog is so famished, that although he took up a small stone and threw it and hit its lean flank with a thud, the animal would not stir away more than a few feet. At last, Wang Lin felt his legs sinking beneath him, and covering his face with his hands, he went away. It is better as it is, he muttered to himself, and for the first time was wholly or completely filled with despair. Do you remember in the biography of, or the introduction, the PowerPoint, how it told us that uh, Pearl S. Buck had many times seen the half-eaten bodies of girls, girl babies, um, on the hillside where she grew up? See how that's factored into this book right here. The next morning when the sun rose, unchanging in its sky of varnished blue, it seemed to him a dream that he could have ever thought of leaving his, health, his house with these helpless children and this weakened woman and this old man. How could they drag their bodies over a hundred miles, even to plenty? Like even if there were plenty of food where they were going, how could they get there in their condition? And who knew whether or not even in the South there was food? One would say there was no end to this brazen sky. Perhaps they would wear out all their last strength only to find more starving people and these strangers to them as well. Far better to stay where they could die in their beds. He sat desponding on the threshold of the door and glazed gazed bleakly over the dried and hardened fields from which every particle of anything which could be called food or fuel had been plucked. He had no money. Long ago, the last coin was gone, but even money would do little good now, for there was no food to buy. He had heard earlier that there were rich men in the town who were hoarding food for themselves and for sale to the very rich, but even this ceased to anger him. He did not feel this day that he could walk to the town even to be fed without money. He was indeed not hungry. The extreme gnawing in his stomach, which he had had at first, was now past. And he could stir up a little of the earth from a certain spot in one of his fields and give it to the children without desiring any of it for himself. 
This earth they had been eating in water for some days. Goddess of Mercy Earth, it was called, because it had some slight nutritional quality in it, although in the end it could not sustain life. So this is what it has come to. Now the only food the children have is to mix some water, a little bit of water into dirt and make a mud that has just a trace of nutritional content. But made into a gruel, it allayed the children's craving for a time and put something into their distended, empty bellies. He steadfastly would not touch the few beans that Olan still held in her hand. And it comforted him vaguely to hear her crunching them one at a time, a long time apart. And then, as he sat there in the doorway, giving up his hope, and thinking with the dreamy pleasure of lying upon his bed and slipping, sleeping easily into death, someone came across the fields, men walking toward him. He continued to sit as they drew near, and he saw that one was his uncle, and with him were three men whom he did not know. I have not seen you these many days, called his uncle with loud and affected. That word means pretended good humor. And as he drew nearer, he said in the same loud voice, And how well you have fared! And your father, my elder brother, is he well? Wang Lu looked at his uncle. The man was thin, it is true but not starved as he should be. Wang Lun felt in his own shriveled body the last remaining strength of life gathering into a devastating anger against this man, his uncle. How have you eaten? How you have eaten, he muttered thickly. He thought nothing of these strangers or of any courtesy. He saw only his uncle with flesh on his bones still. His uncle opened wide his eyes and threw up his hands to the sky. Eaton, he cried, if you could see my house, not a sparrow even could pick up a crumb there. My wife, do you remember how fat she was? How fair and fat and oily her skin? And now she is like a garment hung upon a pole. Nothing but the poor bones rattling together in her skin. And of our children, only four are left. The three little ones, gone. Gone. And as for me, you see me. He took the edge of his sleeve and wiped the corner of his eye carefully. You have eaten, repeated Wang Lin dully. I have thought of nothing but of you and of your father, who is my brother, retorted his uncle briskly, and now I prove it to you. As soon as I could, I borrowed from these good men in the town a little food on the promise that with the strength it gave me, I would help them to buy some of the land about our village. And then I thought of your good land, first of all, you, the son of my brother. They have come to buy your land and to give you money, food, life. His uncle, having said these words, stepped back and folded his arms with a flourish of his dirty and ragged robes. Wang Lin did not move. He did not rise nor in any way recognize the men who had come. But he lifted his head to look at them, and he saw that they were indeed men from the town, dressed in long robes of soiled silk. Their hands were soft and their nails long. They looked as though they had eaten, and blood still ran rapidly in their veins. He suddenly hated them with an immense hatred. Here were these men from the town, having eaten and drunk, standing beside him whose children were starving and eating the very earth of the fields. Here they were, come to squeeze his land from him in his extremity. 
He looked up at them sullenly, his eyes deep and enormous in his bony, skull-like face. I will not sell my land, he said. His uncle stepped forward. At this instant, the younger of Wang Lung's two sons came creeping to the doorway upon his hands and knees. Since he had so, since he had so little strength in these latter days, the child at times had gone back to crawling as he used in his babyhood. So this child is probably, is this the younger one? Yeah. This, this, this kid is probably five years old at this point, maybe six. Is that your lad? cried the uncle. The little fat lad I gave a copper to in the summer? Remember when Wang Lin was out on the farm and the uncle blackmailed him and followed him to Wang Lin's house? And they all looked at the child. And suddenly Wang Lin who through all this time had not wept at all, began to weep silently, the tears gathering in great knots of pain in his throat and rolling down his cheeks, because he sees when the uncle points it out, he remembers what his sons used to look like and now what they look like. What is your price? He whispered at last. Well, there were these three children to be fed, the children and the old man. He and his wife could dig themselves graves in the land and lie down in them and sleep. Well, but here were these. And then one of the men from the city spoke, a man with one eye blind and sunken in his face, and unctuously, that's about to be a vocabulary word, unctuously he said, my poor man, we will give you a better price than could be got in these times anywhere for the sake of the boy who is starving. We will give you, he paused, and then he said harshly, we will give you a string of a hundred pence for an acre. Longling laughed bitterly. Why that, he cried, that is taking my land for a gift. Why, I pay 20 times that when I buy land. I'm sorry, I'm looking here for some notes that I have in this handy little book that you do not have in yours. A string of 100 pence. Well, great. It just says a Chinese unit of money. That was not helpful. Um, so basically he's saying, you're not paying me. You're, you're, I, that would be my giving you my land. Oh, but not when you, he said, Wang Lin, I'm sorry, Wang Lin says, well, I pay 20 times that when I buy land. Oh, but not when you buy it from men who are starving, said the other man from the city. He was a small, slight fellow with a high, thin nose, but his voice came out of him unexpectedly large and coarse and hard. Wang Lin looked at the three of them. They were sure of him, these men. What will not a man give for his starving children and his old father? The weakness of surrender in him melted into an anger such as he had never known in his life before. He sprang up and at the men as a dog springs at an enemy. I shall never sell the land, he shrieked at them, bit by bit. I will dig up the fields and feed the earth itself to the children. And when they die, I will bury them in the land. And I and my wife and my old father, even he, we will die on the land that has given us birth. He was weeping violently and his anger went out of him as suddenly as the wind. And he stood shaking and weeping. The men stood there smiling slightly, his uncle among them unmoved. This talk was madness, and they waited until Wang's anger was spent. And then suddenly, Olan came to the door and spoke to them, her voice flat and commonplace as though every day such things were. The land we will not sell, surely, she said. Else, when we return from the south, we shall have nothing to feed us. But we will sell the table and the two beds 
and the bedding and the four benches and even the cauldron from the stove. But the rakes and the hoe and the plow, we will not sell, nor the land. There was some calmness in her voice which carried more strength than all Wang, Wang Ling's anger. And Wang Ling's uncle said uncertainly, uncertainly, will you really go south? At last the one-eyed man spoke to the others and they muttered among themselves and the one-eyed man turned and said, they are poor things and fit only for fuel. Two silver bits for the lot and take it or leave it. He turned away with contempt as he spoke, but Olan answered tranquilly. It is less than the cost of one bed, but if you have the silver, give it to me quickly and take the things. The one-eyed man fumbled in his girdle and dropped into her outstretched hand the silver, and the three men came into the house, and between them they took out the table and the benches and the bed in Wang Ling's room, first with its bedding, and they wrenched the cauldron from the earthen oven in which it stood. But when they went into the old man's room, Wang Lung's uncle stood outside. He did not wish his older brother to see him, nor did he wish to be there when the old man was laid on the floor and the bed taken from under him. When all was finished and the house was wholly empty except for the two rakes and the two hoes and the plow in one corner of the middle room, Olad said to her husband, let us go while we have the two bits of silver and before we must sell the rafters of the house and have no hole into which we can crawl when we return. And Wang Ling answered heavily, let us go. But he looked across the fields at the small figures of the men receding and he muttered over and over, at least I have the land. I have the land. So that's the end of chapter nine. You will have a quiz on Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday. See you next week.